We've now talked growth hacking, we've talked digital marketing strategies, we've talked marketing technologies, now community, and uh, we also have content marketing on the, on the agenda today. Uh, content marketing is maybe one of the most misunderstood buzzwords of all time. Everybody's doing content, there's a lot of content out there. How do you find the right content uh, marketers to join your team? How do you create valuable content? How do you scale your content strategy? I'm very proud to have with us today John Collins, the managing editor of the Inside Intercom blog, arguably one of the most successful product uh, product blogs worldwide, and he's going to share with us how he did it with uh, with Intercom and how can we do it as well with our products. John, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. So. Uh, I haven't seen any Bucharest, what do you call this picture of Bucharest? I uh, arrived last night and I've been here, so. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about how to grow your business with killer content. Um, I think it's slightly different than what other speakers have talked about in that I want to focus very much on the content rather than the marketing of it. I think sometimes when people talk about content marketing, they think about, oh, we've got to create content, then how are we going to get people to see it? But they kind of gloss over, you know, how are we going to create the good content? What are we going to create that people are going to want to read? Um, my background is I'm a journalist uh, for a long time, around the technology, uh, joined the Intercom about a year and a half ago, so I suppose I'm coming from that bias of, um, of content creation. Intercom, for those of you who don't know, uh, we have a mission of making web business personal. personal. We have a customer communications platform that allows people to, uh, to communicate much more easily with their customers in a sort of like a Facebook Messenger style, uh, rather than horrible contact forms and all that kind of stuff. There's the, the figures uh, that we've, we've both released about, about our growth, it's been, it's been pretty stellar. Um, but I think the key thing for the points of this uh, presentation to remember is for the first two and a half years of Intercom, there was no, uh, there was no marketing outside of, outside of the blog, outside of content. And we only added sales right about that time as well. So content really, really drove and grew the business, both content in terms of blog and also as was uh, event speaking. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, we have a blog called Inside Intercom. Uh, I need to update that slide. Actually, we've over 300 articles on there now. Very much um, what we call evergreen articles. They're like so. It's like timeless advice. We like to think. So this post here, which was it was the, the latest one, when I took the, the screen grab, is actually just about sort of like when you're working in a company, always seeing things from the other side. It's actually Paul, who's our VP of product, talking about being a designer. Pitching things to the, the product manager and, and the product manager not acting on them, and then when he became the product manager himself, kind of realizing, oh, okay, that's not actually what's important for being a product manager. So we've got 300 of these kind of articles, we get hundreds of thousand page views every month, and we've got 30,000 new thousand subscribers to get our content every week. Uh, one of our newer tactics is books. Uh, they are electronic books, but we don't like the term ebooks because I think it uh, kind of devalues the whole thing. Uh, but we've done three in terms of product management, customer engagement, and support. We've got 10,000 downloads and a big halo effect from them, just a lot of positive feedback. And our latest, uh, latest content uh, project is our podcast, Inside Intercom Podcast. Again, I suppose we kind of feel that a lot of podcasts uh, are very long, they're not very focused. You know, people go on and on. I've seen podcasts that are two hours long, and you're like, you know, who, who has time to listen to these things? So what we do is we try and have relatively short, 30, 40 minute uh, interviews with people we admire uh, in the industry. Um, when you do content, it is a bit of an ego stroke. You know, it's like, oh, isn't this great? We're getting all this social media. Um, you see there in the top left, um, Mike Davidson, he's the VP of, uh, of, uh, of Design and Twitter. He's very complimentary about our blog. He's actually going to be on our podcast soon. Kind of came out of that conversation. Tim O'Reilly there in the top, in the middle, the legendary, um, sort of software industry publisher and, and, and sort of commentator. Um, but then also people you've never met. So there's a lady there, uh, Nino Ferez, on the bottom left, she said, tweeted that our blog was her favorite thing to read now. Uh, checked her out, she's got over 100,000 followers. She's in Egypt, she's an entrepreneur there, she won the Microsoft Magic Cup. And you're just like, how would we connect with people like this without uh, content? Similarly, actually, we have, uh, I have one there from Ryan Hoover from Product Hunt. Uh, Product Hunt are very good to us, I have to say. So I'll just uh, point out Graham. Um, but, um, yeah, he talked about our content marketing strategy. Again, page views. So we're doing this. Page views are going up and to the right. Um, you know, page views this year will be, obviously, the year isn't over, so it'll be even higher than that. But actually, 
page views, social media mentions, all very nice, but really, how do they benefit your business? They don't really. So key thing for us is that actually people who visit our marketing site and then go on to the blog. So they come, they want to read about Intercom's products, and they say, oh, these guys have a blog, let's see what they're writing about, let's see what they're talking about. Those people actually read the blog, and so I suppose they kind of fall into the worldview, they fall into like what we think about support, what we think about product management, before they buy our tools to do those jobs. Well, they're four, the, you know, the, those people, are, once they've gone through those steps, are four times more likely to be, uh, become a paying customer than if they just visit the marketing page. But even more importantly, those customers spend a hell of a lot more money with us, and they stay with us longer. So they're more engaged, bigger spending customers. So, you know, I think uh, sometimes it can seem like you're doing content just to sort of, you know, what, what's the purpose of it? I think the key thing and for us has been to be very focused on why you're doing content. So, enough about us. Now, can you harness your uh, content superpowers? I'd like to maybe just share some of the things I've learned in the year and a half uh, that I've, I've been running content at Intercom, and also I suppose some of the things that uh, came up before I joined. Uh, I think a key thing, and uh, I see this all the time, is the CEO will go, hey, we're going to do content. Content's going to be the new thing here at the company. And then you go, well, are you going to, are you going to blog? Are you going to write anything? And it's like, oh, no, I can't write. You know, I don't have time to write. I'm, you know. um, if, if people who are leaving the company are not writing and creating content, it's going to be really, really hard to have any kind of meaningful uh, content strategy. So Dennis, who's our co-founder, um, one of our four co-founders, he's been chief operations officer, he's been VP of uh, customer success, he's now chief strategy officer, you know, busy guy, but for two and a half years, he literally ran the blog, made sure that there was at least one post a week so we could have a newsletter that went out with a new post in it, and encouraged other people to, to, to blog, went out and found guest, uh, guest people to blog. And so as a result of all that is that no one sees that intercom, they don't see, oh, I forgot to do a blog post. People actually say, hey, I'm going to do a blog post, this is actually going to benefit my career. Designers, engineers, they say, you know, this is something uh, we need to do. And even this quarter, actually, we've gone a step further as a company. And our CEO has made a company-wide goal to produce more content, to actually talk more about how great Intercom is, because we feel we haven't told people enough about that. Uh, but as a result, so everyone is now sort of contributing uh, blog posts, which is great. Uh, the other thing I think as well, just coming to the top, is quite interesting. Uh, Owen, our CEO, is a designer um, in his background. Um, and rather than do a, when we raised our Series C uh, in August, rather than do a very boring Hey, Intercom, we're pleased to announce we just raised this amount of money from these investors. Uh, with about four days to go before an announcement, he said, Hey, why don't we do a cartoon? And I was like, Okay, that's great. And with a day to go, I still haven't seen the cartoon, but ultimately we ended up with a comic on our site, uh, which really actually goes back, no, it's just quite, goes through the whole sort of what Intercom is trying to address uh, with, 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 with the products we have in terms of making business communications personal. And as a result, we had uh, far more traffic to come and find out about our fundraising. And also we have people actually talking about the way we announce our fundraising, which I think is pretty, pretty unique for, uh, for a software company. Um, something else we do is we're very uh, open and generous in sharing what we've learned. So this is a post by Paul again, uh, talking about how we actually go from idea to like a piece of code that's like being used, as feature that's being used in the hands of our customers. Um, some people say, oh, it's great to do these things because you're giving something back to the community. Um, that kind of suggests in some way that you've taken something from the community. Um, the way I like to think about it much more is, you know, the scientists, doctors, people like that, they all want to write and document what they do to sort of improve their profession. So, you know, I think as people who are making software, why, why don't we feel the same way? And it's, at Intercom, it's not just something, you know, that people are actually, the designers or the, the engineers uh, or product managers uh, worry about, you know, people who are actually making the software, but we write about things like, time management, we write about things like sales, uh, we come to conferences and talk about content marketing to people. Um, and it's just, I think, all part of the feeling that like, we can all do a better job of what we're doing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's so many people out there making products, why not try and make it better for, for everyone? Um, I think also if you're going to do content, it's really, really important to have some kind of opinion. Um, you see so many corporate uh, blogs and corporate publications, and I'm sure you can almost see that, like, you know, someone wrote something, and then it went to their boss, who kind of took out a lot of things in case it kind of annoyed someone further up the chain, and then it went to the CEO, who took it out because he was worried about 
consulting fashion and competitor. And so you end up with things on a blog that really have no opinion, that have no bite. Uh, they're very, very bland. And then people wonder why no one's reading them. So uh, this is a good example of it. Why Paul Calling is Dead, written by our VP of Sales, Russ. Uh, and it wasn't just actually an opinion. Uh, he backed it up with very much looked at the, 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 the finances of why it doesn't make sense to hire a bunch of salespeople and get them to cold call, that actually you're much better off spending your money on marketing and demand generation on things like books and blogs and things like that, and then following up with people who, who download or interact with your content or come to your conferences, etc. Um, but this purely was a conversation that I had at Russ at lunchtime one day when we went, hey, cold call things dead. And I was like, that's, yeah, that, people aren't, you know, not many people are saying that. Uh, or maybe they're saying it, we haven't actually articulated it properly. And so we worked on it and it became a, became a blog post. Um, something that else I think is really, really important uh, and I don't see enough. Um, people think about uh, content as, oh yeah, you know, I'll, I'll get to it, I'll write that post at the weekend. Or, you know, it's like as if writing is something that you do at a different time than the other things, activities you do in a company. I think if you're really serious about content, You've just got to create the time and space to write. A bit of quiet time or whatever it is, block out your diary and do it. Uh, people used to constantly ask us, where do you find the time to write? But no one would ever ask us, where do you time to find the time to code or design or make an actual product? As if, you know, it's in some way, some way different. Um, I think uh, one thing one thing I would say is there's no, uh, there's no quick wins here. There's no real shortcuts if you really want to create good content that engages people who then become customers. Um, I see a huge sort of industry uh, around content marketing and it's very much trying to like sell people this idea of a silver bullet. Like you just do this one thing, you get lots of traffic, you get lots of engaged readers. I really don't think there are there are any shortcuts or any, any quick ways around it other than sort of uh, doing the hard work. Uh, for us, we've recently sort of started to scale this and really try and invest in it. We now have a team of four people creating content. Uh, myself, we have two uh, content marketing managers in San Francisco, Sarah and Adam. Um, and then we have uh, Jeffrey, a content editor, who's joining me on the team in Dublin and Ireland. Um, but I think the key thing there is uh, Intercom is a pretty smart company. Uh, it's been backed by pretty, some pretty smart investors. So, you know, basically the, the, the finances add up. There's no way we would be investing in this if content didn't didn't deliver to our, to our bottom line. Um, and the way we do that now as we're scaling is we kind of look at this very much like that it's editorially driven. Like we're like a publication. Um, you know, we're not constantly trying to push our own agenda. We're very much looking at, hey, you know, is this something I'd want to read? Uh, is this something people like my peers would want to read? Is it something that other people in the industry want to read? You know, just the same way as I used to do when I was working for websites or working for newspapers or, or, or magazines. You know, you can't create this kind of sweatshop where you're just like, you know, okay, we're going to knock out four or five blog posts in a week. I mean, you can do that, and you probably will get some short-term benefits, but I think in terms of something that's got a lot long-term reputation, um, it's not a sustainable strategy. Um, if you are going to go down the content route, I, I absolutely would caution that it's a, it's a slow return. Um, you know, you're not going to see returns uh, this quarter if you start, like, blogging or doing books or whatever it is you might do. I think you need to be prepared to give it, you know, two, three quarters. Uh, one of the big things I see, big issues I see is people start, you know, a blog or whatever content uh, strategy it is, and they really go for it, they're really enthusiastic, and then after a month or six weeks, they're not getting the instant results they were expecting, and suddenly, like, everyone loses enthusiasm, and it, it peters out. Um, it is a very slow return, um, but it will pay off. Um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with a guy called Thomas Tunis. He's a venture capitalist uh, with Red Point Ventures in, the, in uh, San Francisco. He writes a lot um, about content marketing. And what he did was quite interesting. He actually looked at, um, say, the difference between evergreen content, which is the kind of content we're trying to create, where it's like, you know, you're trying to be timeless about it. In fact, we're so timeless that we actually don't even put the dates on our articles. Because we know that we have an article about like fundraising, SaaS fundraising, for instance, or something like that. And it has a date stamp of three, four, five months ago. People go, oh, should I go somewhere else? There must be a newer article on this. So we're pretty, um, I suppose we say we're pretty kind of a little bit extreme in, in terms of how we approach um, 
being evergreen. But he compares uh, this kind of evergreen content to sort of very topical or news-based content where you might like blog about something related to the Apple Watch when it's just been released and try and cap capitalize on some of that traffic where people are, you know, people are going to be looking for this term and see so your take on it or what it means for your industry or whatever it might be. Um, and that traffic ends up being very spiky. You get maybe like 100 page views today because it's topical, but you know, you get five page views tomorrow and like in a year's time you'll probably get no page views. If you do a, a evergreen strategy, you start off with 100 page views, you know, in, in, even if you're only getting 10 page views in, in a year's time, the cumulative effect of that, but your content is still producing uh, in a year's time, means that you get a lovely, lovely graph like this, which means, you know, you've got a, a, a blog that's uh, attracting maybe like 100,000 page views uh, a month versus, uh, I think the comparison was like, you know, you get about 40, 50,000 if, you, if you're doing the, the, the news uh, stuff. Uh, we very much see the proof of that at, at Intercom. Uh, this is a very good example uh, from Paul again. Paul uh, joined Intercom relatively early on. He was a big hire for us. He was a big, big, big gamble. He was uh, had worked at Facebook in Silicon Valley and for Google. He had written a book called Groups. You know, was a very influential uh, thinker around social media at the time. Uh, and so, like, Paul arrived, he had lots of things to do at Intercom. There was lots of work to be done, but he actually spent at least a day, probably a bit more on this post, why cars are the future of the web. You probably think, that's crazy, why, why did he spend time doing that? That uh, blog post still generates, it can be in the top five articles, it was actually in our top five most read articles yesterday, generated a couple hundred page views. Um, it is, I think, probably our second or third most read ever. So just by creating something that's really, really time, uh, timeless, it's actually two years old, that article at this stage, uh, or over two years old, and it's still, it's still generating uh, traffic every day. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a really good strategy to, to adopt that timeless approach. Um, the other thing I'd say is, like, think about your business and what are you experts on. If you've got a business, surely you're, you're an expert on something and you can write about it. But this is a really good example. Uh, anyone who's sort of uh, interested in marketing SEO is probably aware of Whiteboard Friday, uh, which is an initiative by this guy, Rand Fishkin, who um, founded Moz, who, uh, full disclosure, are customers of Intercom. But, um, he, he basically every every week does a video. He writes on a topic on a whiteboard, and he literally just talks through it. Uh, Rand's got a pretty pretty uh, great big personality, so it works really well for him. Um, but I mean, if you can find something that like you know you can own and you can become branded as you know it's your thing, and that's just just so powerful as a uh, piece of marketing. Um, the other thing I'd say is um, I don't know if people remember this uh, cartoon from. Web 1.0, maybe. Uh, it was in the New Yorker, like, I think, like, 96 or something, 95, 96. And it was basically two dogs going on the internet and saying, hey, on the internet, nobody knows your dog. Uh, unfortunately, nowadays, thanks to Google, Facebook, you know, not only do they know your dog, but they know what kennel you were brought up at, they know who your parents are. You know, basically the point is, people will find you out very, very quickly. So don't try and, you know, BS people that you're an expert in a particular area when you're not. I mean, write about what you know, write about what you have an, you have an opinion on. Uh, another thing I see um, all the time, uh, which is a, a really big issue, particularly with, say, um, engineers or designers or anyone who's sort of, like, are sort of experts on a particular topic, um, that, you know, you, you'll hear them say something, you'll have a conversation with them at lunch, or you'll see a presentation with their game attorney in the company, and you say, that will be, you know, something really good, we can turn into a blog post, and they'll say, Everyone knows that. I mean, why would you do that? But actually, uh, I think it's a well-written, concise take on, on how to do something that's, that's useful for, for your customers is, is really valuable. So this was basically an internal presentation that one of our customers, uh, support engineers, gave, which was talking about you know how to file a bug. If you find a bug in Intercom, how to file that, how to, how to do it so that it's useful for our product engineers. We basically reworked it slightly to make it more general and more applicable to, to, to anyone who, who, who has a product. Uh, got it out the, on the blog, and as a result, it's, like, it's done really, really well for us. Um, but, you know, I said that when I said that to Martin, he's kind of like, hey, surely everyone knows how to follow the book. But actually, they don't. Uh, and if you do it well, it can be really, really powerful. Um, so the other thing I would say is there's a lot of talk uh, about thought leadership and you know what thought leadership is. In a lot of places, I think uh, thought leadership is basically whatever the CEO uh, is, is thinking that week. And I think often people are afraid to challenge them and sort of say, well, that's not terribly interesting. 
Um, I think a really, really uh, good way to sort of check if what you're, what you're writing about is genuinely thought leadership um, is if people disagree with it. Uh, again, this is a, actually the most popular post we've written, uh, the end of apps as we know them, talking about what might come after mobile apps, you know, it's kind of hard. This apps obsessed world to remember in 2007 the iPhone launched without an app store. Um, you know, that whole idea has just been around for, for, for seven or eight years. Um, and so Paul was talking about what might come after apps. And guess what? 123 comments on that article. Uh, about 121 of those comments were telling us why, why he was wrong and why he was an idiot. But guess what? It's generated huge amounts of traffic, huge amounts of feedback. And I think some of those um, social shares from high profile people I showed at the start, uh, quite a few of them were in, were in relation to this, this post. Um, I'm kind of flown through my presentation well because, uh, like you, you guys, I'm actually kind of uh, hungry for lunch. But um, I think this is uh, pretty much the last, the last thing I'll leave you with, which is uh, I don't know if you know this movie, Thank Gary, Glenn Ross. You haven't seen it, it's absolutely classic. Uh, Alec Baldwin is uh, talking to these kind of noble upper estate agents about how they, they should be selling houses, and he gives this famous speech about always be closing. Um, don't always be closing. It's a constant mistake people make, I think, when they're doing content. People don't come to your blog, they don't download your book because they want to know about you or what you're doing. They do it because they want to do their job better. They want to get a shortcut or get a, you know, get help in doing in doing what they do um, in better. But they really, really don't want to know about you. So, with that, uh, I'm more than happy to take any questions that might be, or I'll be around afterwards if uh, if people want to go and grab lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and we've got the first question over there. Okay, so how do we, how do we uh, measure the success of the content? Yeah, so what we, what we track uh, at the moment, the key thing we track, I don't get too much into maybe like our marketing funnel setup, but what we would track is uh, trials. Like, why did you be content? How many people actually had a trial of, of, of Intercom's results? So, and we track that through email addresses. So obviously to get a trial of Intercom, they have to give us their email address. So yeah, I mean, page views would only really be important if we were selling advertising. We're not selling advertising. Uh, so page views are nice to kind of give you an indication of, you know, something you've written is, is resonating with your audience if it's in any way, uh, you know, of, of use or value to them. But yeah, um, basically emails, is, 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 is the key metric we look at every week of uh, how, many, how many emails we generate. Uh, and like for things like a book where like we're, we're clearly looking for an email address, it's very easy to track that. Uh, when it comes to things like the metrics I showed you at the start where it said there's four times more likely to become a customer after visiting the blog, uh, it's quite a complex setup in terms of how we track that. But we have an analytics team. We've had an analytics team from a pretty early stage in Intercom, which has allowed us to sort of look at things like the value of content uh, at, at a much deeper level than, say, what you get from Google Analytics. Thank you. Any other questions for John? Uh, how, often, how often do you write a post? And uh, at what time do you share it? I mean, do you, uh, do you share it uh, Wednesday or Friday? Okay, yeah, cool. Uh, at the moment, uh, in terms of the blog, uh, we're doing probably about uh, three posts a week. Uh, in terms of the podcast, we aim to have one uh, about every two weeks. Uh, we haven't really sort of, it's a newer tactic for us to podcast, so we haven't really hit our um, cadence on that. And in terms of the books, we're aiming to do uh, three, three a year, so spread them out over the course of the year. Uh, in terms of actually the timing of the blog posts, we will generally publish blog posts late evening in your, or not late evening, but sort of like around 5.30, 7.30 uh, Bucharest time in the evening because that's like morning time on, on, on the west coast in San Francisco. So actually when we publish at that time it's kind of you get the biggest uh, proportion of our sort of potential readers are online at that time so it's kind of comes up. Particularly say in San Francisco if you publish at 9 o'clock in the morning it's kind of at the top of people's feeds as they come into work. Um, the best days, uh, I think this is probably like, I haven't seen any online property that this is in the same as but like 
Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the best days for traffic. Uh, things die off, start to die off a bit on Friday because people are just disengaging and want to get away for the weekend, whatever it is. And I think one day, you know, people are mm, starting to think about the week and what they're going to do. Uh, one interesting one, though, is I think Sunday evening is a, is a great opportunity. Uh, it depends on what kind of content you're doing, but uh, one of the things we do at the moment is we republish older posts because they're evergreen and haven't got a date on them. So we have republished on medium.com. And actually, Sunday evening is a, is a really good time to, to publish there because you know, so people start to think about work, so they probably open the laptop, but they don't really feel like working. So they're kind of like, hmm, I wonder if we can find an interesting article to read that's related to work. And I kind of feel like I'm working, but you know, so it's definitely an opportunity there. But you'll find, you know, as you publish more content, you will find those kind of little, little things about your audience that I think would be quite uh, productive. Question there. Adrian, you. So, uh, I was thinking about your blog, about what you write about. So, I heard several times today something uh, surprised me that when you're trying to personalize, uh, so when you're trying to personalize uh, your contact with your clients or your leads, one advice is to write handwritten notes. Yes, so, does that mean that penmanship is starting to become an important skill again? Um, I think that's all down to the individual. Um, everyone, everyone has a different writing style. Um, yeah, I don't carry around a notebook, I carry around a moleskin. You know, the old leather bound notebooks, I take notes. Uh, like other people, you know, uh, Des, who I mentioned to, uh, who uh, one of our co founders runs the blog. I mean, whenever I'm meeting with him, everything is on his phone, all the service. And he likes to say, I, I tweeted something about this two years ago, and he'll find it, you know, that's his way of taking notes. My way to take notes is I have, as I say, a moleskin and it's kind of chronological, I know and so forth. So I think it just really depends on, on your, your own personal style, um, you know, but uh, whatever works for you. Any other question? Okay, thank you very thank much. You. So it's now time uh, for the lunch break. Uh, we have uh, sandwiches as well as uh, during the coffee break and uh, everything is available outside on the hall. I'll kindly ask you to be back here at 2.30. Uh, we're going to uh, shorten this time a little bit in order to get back on schedule. And uh, at 2.30 we're going to have the gadget showcase. So be here in order to see product demos live on stage. Thank you and enjoy your break. <laughs>